<clears throat> Mark chapter 5, all of hell is breaking loose trying to keep, prevent Jesus to continuing the, the story of the kingdom of God. The Decapolis is mentioned only three times in the New Testament. In addition, there's a couple other instances where Jesus visits specific locations in a largely pagan league of cities to the east side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee. There's evidence of Jewish communities in these cities. Most had synagogues, though they were constructed long after this moment in Mark chapter 5. It seems clear that this area was considered pagan, uh, otherworldly, by Jews who were devoted to Israel's God in the Old Testament, his Torah, as the guide for uh, their lives. Jesus is going to visit the Decapolis, this region, this area, and he's going to help the, the ministry of the kingdom of God and to teach the disciples what he is really about to seek and save those that are lost. Alexander the Great had a mission. He wanted the whole world to be under the influence of Greek culture and religion and language and philosophy, political structures and values. He died before he could make this dream a reality, but his successors accomplished uh, this goal to a large degree in Greek culture, in Greek institutions. It was established in cities all around this area, including Jerusalem and around the Sea of Galilee and beyond. Theaters became uh, well-known and common and popular. The rabbis of Israel would forbade attendance at these theaters because the dramas uh, portrayed the myths of Greek and Roman gods. They contained erotic themes common to Hellenism and were performed in connection with pagan religious festivals, which included sacrifices to the gods. Uh, the Greek culture was known for gymnasiums and Greek educational institutions that appeared in many cities, even not far from the temple. In the gymnasium, the Greek idea of training people's bodies and minds wasn't enough just to put something into practice, into motion, but actually they would study this so that the body would actually physically become preeminent and most important in all things. This is why classical Greek education received athletic training and eventually competed, uh, competed naked in athletic events like the Olympics, which, praise God, has changed a little bit since then. Can I get an Amen. Greek mythology offered heroes and role models who competed with the Jewish biblical ancestors. The Pharisees, devoted to keeping God's people faithful to the Torah, constantly admonishing young Jews intrigued by Greek culture and feeling the sway of their culture, wanting to go away from the moorings of, of Judaism. Hellenistic cities had stadiums for the public display of athletic contests, and temples were built to not only honor local gods and festivals to celebrate uh, pagan holidays, but in the midst of all this attraction, faithful Jewish populations would struggle to really believe in the one true God. At its core, Hellenism was humanism. It glorified human beings above all other creatures and portrayed the human body as ultimate in its physical beauty. The religious Jews of Galilee struggled against the pagan worldview, seeing the exceptional modern perspective of Hellenism. It began to cripple its society and began to see how it's pushing away the truth of the one true God. The glorification of sexuality and violence and wealth in human form, the, the view that the human mind can understand and formulate all things in all places and actually make yourself a God. This is what the teaching of the time and culture. And in some, so, so many ways, so many things have changed. And in so many ways, some things have stayed the same. And Jesus now continuing his ministry is in Mark chapter 5. And Jesus, as we mentioned last week, Jesus has has been on the disciples. He tells them to load up a boat. They've, <clears throat> they've had this storm. He settles the demonic sea because most of the time people would think when there was massive waves and, and thunder and lightning that it was actually the water that was controlled by the monsters underneath the deep, the demons of the sea. And so Jesus goes across this boat and he's showing them, he's teaching them, listen, I have authority over all things. I even have authority over the sea. I even have authority over those demons that you think are active under the water. And we're going to go to the other side. And Jesus might as well dropped a spiritual mind bomb on them when he told them he wants to go to the other side of the sea here in Mark chapter 5. He's got something he wants to teach them. He wants to show them that there's not just a lower story going on, but there's an upper story going on. And when he says he wants to go to the other side, man, the disciples are confused. They're frustrated. They're angry. They're nervous. You see, we read the text in Mark 5, and, oh, Jesus gets in a boat. He has a couple of bumpy waves across the Sea of Galilee and just gets to the other side. But what we have to know is the context of what's happening here. And what's happening here is there's a battleground because there's people who think the world's a playground, but Jesus knows it's a battleground and he sees the war, he knows the war, and he goes to the other side. And the disciples are like, Jesus, why would you want to go to the other side? 
Like that's the place where they think that the physical body is preeminent. That's the place where they actually have sacrifices of children on altars of worship. That's a place where there's tons of Hellenistic culture. It's opposite of Judaism. Jesus, we don't want to go to the other side. People who follow God never go to the other side. But Jesus was here for both sides. Jesus was here not to just come after those who think they needed no doctor. Jesus was here to actually heal those who were sick. And Jesus is going to teach the disciples that he has been always about going to the other side. <clears throat> Jesus is going to, it's going to actually push them and, and prod them and teach them that the gospel is for other side people. People who believe opposite, people who act opposite, people who, who worship opposite, people who have addictions and troubles of many kind, people who have been enslaved by their false ideology and beliefs, people who actually believe the world is it and this is the world we ought to live for, people who have given their lives over to, to things that where the ru rust and moth will eventually destroy, people who are leaving for the, living for the temporal rather than the eternal. The gospel is for other side people. And Jesus drops this spiritual balm on them to say, listen, we're going to continue the ministry and we're going to go to the other side. And the disciples' minds are blown that Jesus would leave the Jewish culture and go to the culture of the Gentiles to teach them that the gospel is for other side people. And really, immediately, you ought to be awake and alive and excited that the, the gospel is for other side people because guess what? Almost every person in this room is included in the other side. We are, most of us are all Gentiles. And Jesus here is going to teach the disciples that he came just not for those who were on his side, but those who were on the other side. Mark chapter 5 is immediate and quickly teaching us that the kingdom of God is for other side people. And I just, if we were to press pause right there for a second, I just wonder if you and I face every day people that we kind of view as on the other side. People who are maybe on the other side of the politics, people who are on the other side of what the Bible teaches, people who are on the other side of what your kind of preferences are, people who are on the other side of how you were raised, people who are on the other side of the church that you go to, the people who are on the other side of what the gospel teaches, the people who are on the other side of anything that you would identify as truly God, people on the other side. Friends, let's be reminded today that the gospel is for those people. Let's be reminded today by God's grace that he is pushing us and leaning into us to be like just this moment where Jesus has to lead them to the other side. In the first century Jew, they're traveling to an unclean pagan land of people so filthy that they want to be like, hey, Jesus, don't you remember? Don't you remember in the Old Testament when Joshua drove the other side kind of people out? Don't you remember that, 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 that the people of God were suddenly finding themselves in the devil's homeland? And that there was a storm that was rising and then Bell's power was over the storm in the sea. Don't you, have you heard Jesus about the rabbinic tradition that tells us that Joshua drove the seven nations out of the promised land? And Joshua chapter three talked about in Acts 13. And now you're going to go minister to the other side of the people and to the seven nations among the 10 cities in the Decapolis region. And Jesus tells them it's time for us to go to the other side. It's almost like if Jesus was in the 21st century, he would have written a song that says, let's go to the other side because I got what you need. So come with me and take the ride. I'll take you to the other side because you can do like you do or you can do like me or you can stay in the cage or you can finally be free. You're going to need a free to fly to the other side. I'll take you to the other side. And some of you guys just got that and some of you know have no idea what I'm talking about, but that was original. You'll get it later. Let's go, Jesus says, to the other side. And in this moment, they must have thought that Jesus was like deranged and tormented or tomb dwelling or self-mutilating because they know, they've heard rumors, they've heard gossip, they've heard the Jewish times teach about what people are like on the other side. And the boat finally gets to the other side. And about the moment, Mark chapter 5, verse 2, they step off the boat. And wouldn't you know, the first person they meet is exactly what they've heard rumors about for so many years. It's an other side kind of person, verse 2. If you're there, Mark chapter 5, verse 2, will you say, I got it? And Jesus got out of the boat, and a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This is not the person you wanted on the greeting committee on the other side. 
This is not the person that these Jewish believers wanted to greet and meet. This is a person that's known as the demonic man. This is the one who's possessed by demons. And Jesus gets out of the boat. The disciples are getting out of the boat. And you can just imagine they're going like, Jesus, see, we told you. We told you this is what it looks like on the other side. And this man, full of demons, gets out to basically confront Jesus and the disciples like he's confronted all people all across these villages and across these ten cities. You know, it's not easy to actually preach on this passage in Mark chapter 5. Whenever preachers run across a text that talks about demons, we're just honestly tempted to skip that part and keep reading. But when you read the Gospel of Mark, it gets kind of hard to do that. I mean, it starts off in the beginning in chapter, Mark chapter 1. Jesus calls the disciples, and the first thing they do is they encounter a man with an unclean spirit inside the synagogue. Imagine that people with unclean spirit inside a church, but that's for later. A few verses later, we're told that Jesus, that Jesus takes the disciples through Galilee, proclaiming the message and casting out demons. Then in chapter 3, Jesus sends the disciples out on their own to proclaim the message and cast out demons. In Mark chapter 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, you keep seeing the work of God advancing, but you keep seeing demonic activity trying to prevent the advancement of the kingdom of God. And Mark, the gospel, is making it crystal clear that we're not in a playground in this world. We are in a battleground. And as one scholar once said, there can be no sound theology without a sound demonology. And the sound demonology that we need today is that it is real. And in the 21st century, it still happens today. <clears throat> Demons are fallen angels, Revelation 12. Satan's fall from heaven is symbolically described in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And when he fell, Satan took some of the angels with him, one third of them, Revelation 12, Jude 6. And mentions angels who sin. So biblically, demons are fallen angels who along with Satan chose to rebel against God. Some of the demons are already locked in darkness, bound with everlasting chains, Jude 1. Others are free to roam and referred to as the powers of the dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, Ephesians 6, Colossians 2. The demons still follow Satan as their leader and do battle with the holy angels and attempt to thwart God's plan and hinder God's people, Daniel chapter 10. The bad news is demons as spirit beings have the ability to take possession of physical bodies. Demonic possession occurs when a person's body is completely controlled by a demon. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. This cannot happen to a child of God since the Holy Spirit resides in the heart of every believer in Christ, 1 John 4. That's great news, is it not? Satan and his demons now look to destroy the work of God and deceive anyone they can, 1 Peter 5, 2 Corinthians 11. The demons are described as evil spirits, Matthew 10, unclean spirits, Mark 1, lying spirits, 1 Kings 22, and angels of Satan, Revelation 12. Satan and his demons deceive the world, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, propagate false doctrine, 1 Timothy 4, attack Christians, 2 Corinthians 12, and combat holy angels, Revelation 12. The good news is that demons and fallen angels are enemies of God, but they are defeated enemies of God. In other words, they don't play for the home team and they don't play for the winning team. They are in the game, but they are losing. They're incredibly behind. We're not sure how much time's on the clock, but it doesn't matter how much time's on the clock because we know who wins the game. Christ has disarmed the powers and authorities. He's made public a spectacle of them. He's triumphed over them by the work of the cross, Colossians 2. And as we submit to God and resist the devil, we have nothing to fear. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world, 1 John chapter 4. So that today in Mark chapter 5 is just a little pit stop for demonology. Demons are real. They do exist. If you are a follower of Christ, they cannot possess you, but they can oppress you. C.S. Lewis once wrote, There's two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist and magician with the same delight. In other words, if you say the day... There's no spiritual forces of darkness. There's no demonic activity. Everything I see with my eyes in the natural is what it is. There's no supernatural. Then, friends, you have been deceived. At the other hand, if every time you look ever, uh, under every rock and every newton cranny and every uh, uh, corner, around every corner of every wall, and you claim everything is demonic, friends, you've probably been a little confused as well because not everything is demonic. Sometimes it's just simply me. 
Sometimes it's just my flesh. It's your flesh. Sometimes it's our sin. It's the consequences of our own sinful nature and rebellion against God. And as we stray away from God and run away from His will and purposes, as we shake our fist at God and say to God we know better than Him, then the demons stand and applaud because they don't need to work with us. They can move on to the next thing. And so either by saying it's everything or nothing, don't fall in one of those errors. Know that demonic activity is true and real and can possess people, unbelieving people, who do not believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, have not submitted their will and way to God, or can oppress Christians. And friends, if you're a Christ follower and you're about the kingdom of God, doing the work of God, one day, somehow, some way, in some situation, you will face spiritual oppression. But praise God, you cannot face spiritual possession. And here we notice in Mark chapter 5, they run into the greeting crew of the demonic man. We see that the demons are unclean, evil and filthy, physically and morally. We see that it leads to filth and squalor and rubbish and dirt. We, we see that it leads to all kinds of oppression and obscenity and perversion. We see that this man's been isolated. He's been living where? In the tombs. I mean, have you ever wanted to live at a graveyard? You might have hung out there once. You might have went by there once. When you were a younger teenager, you maybe ran through there fast once. But you don't want to live there. And this is what spiritual oppression does and possession. It isolates you from the work of God by the Spirit of God, from the Word of God and the people of God. So know this, anytime you're spiritually oppressed, you'll actually begin to feel this desire, this temptation to take you from the very people, from the very Word, from the very Spirit of God that you desperately need the most. Because he wants to isolate you. He wants to corner you. He wants you to be like a fallen soldier in the corner of a ring so that he can beat you up all by yourself when you have no posse to help defend you, encourage you, and hold up your arms to help you. And so we see this demonic man. He's not only isolated, he has superhuman strength. They can't bind him. They can't hold him back with chains. He's been tearing them apart. We see that he's self-destructing. He's trying to hurt himself. And listen, the whispers, the enemies, the lie of the enemy will try to get you. If he can't destroy you, he will try to tempt you to hurt your body physically. That's spiritual oppression. That's the enemy trying to get you to buy into lies and whispers of condemnation because of who you are or what you've done or whatever you've gone through or what you feel like you fall short in. And this is happening to this man. The local townspeople have attempted to restrain him with terrifying Herculean strength. He's broken the fetters which bound him. He's uncontrollable. He's dangerous. He's wretched. He's howling. He's gashing. He's got jagged rocks. He's, he's got an evil spirit. He's foaming at the mouth. He's had lacerations and scabs and infections and scar tissue. He's been living in years of delirium, of pain. No one can bind him. No one can chain him down. And he's destroying the community around it. And people don't know what to do. And there he is greeting Jesus as Jesus steps on the other side. And no one knows where to go and where to take him. Speaking of demonic possession, author Alfred Webers, a former soldier in two world wars, says that demonic possession and oppression seems like the world wars. He, he describes it as this, it was as if certain forces sprang out of the ground, giants of action, crafty, hungry for power, which nobody had noticed before, seemed to shoot up like a crop of dragon's teeth. This is what it felt like in Mark chapter 5. This is what it looked like when this man began to greet Jesus. <clears throat> See, the reality is, it's not an easy story to talk about because spiritual demonic possession is not something that we see a lot. At least we don't think we see it here in North America. What's interesting is, if you interview Christians across the world, if you go to Central America, if you go to South America, if you go to any, any countries in Asia, if you go to the Middle East, you, you, it'll be real clear to every Christian that they've seen spiritual possession. There's no doubt about it. But not so much, it seems, in North America. At least none that we think we can recognize. The Washington Post recently ran a controversial op-ed piece titled, As a Psychiatrist, I Help Spot Demonic Possession. The subtitle read, How a Scientist Learned to Work with Exorcists. 
The author, Richard Gallagher, is a board-certified psychiatrist and a professor of clinical psychiatry at the New York Medical College. Dr. Gallagher wrote, For the past two and a half decades and over several hundred consultations, I've helped clergy from multiple denominations and faiths to filter episodes which represent the overwhelming majority of cases from literally the devil's work. It's an unlikely role for an academic physician, but I don't see these two aspects of my career in conflict. The same habits that shape what I do as a professor and a psychiatrist are the same uh, evidence that I need in discerning attacks, but what I believe are e evil spirits and how to differentiate the extremely rare events from medical conditions. It's possible, he writes, to be a sophisticated psychiatrist and believe that evil spirits are however seldom, but they still assail humans. Most of my scientific colleagues and friends say no because of their frequent contact with patients who are deluded about demons, their general skepticism of the supernatural, their commitment to employ only standard peer-reviewed treatments that do not potentially mislead or harm vulnerable patients. But careful observation of the evidence presented to me in my career has led me to believe that certain extremely uncommon cases can be explained in no other way but spiritual possession. Friends, this is true. This is real, and this still happens in the world. Mark chapter 5. Here, Jesus is going to teach us, remind us, that the gospel is good news for bad news people. This demonic man was bad news for the whole community. Nobody wanted to be around him. Nobody wanted to be near him. They had been ravaged by his life of rebellion against God and possession by these demons. Verse 6, but when Jesus saw him from a distance, this man ran and fell on his knees in front of him. The disciples, you can imagine, were sweating. I mean, they were breaking out in a cold sweat. They didn't know what was going to happen. And the moment this man sees that it's Jesus, suddenly all the demons that possessed him and, and ravaged him and owned him and led him suddenly bowed at the feet of Jesus. The demons begin to shout at the top of his voice, Swear to God, you won't torture us. Jesus said, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. And the demons, they're afraid of the final doom. They know that the name of Jesus, just Jesus speaking the word, they bowed down. How beautiful is this, right? Like how beautiful is the name that Jesus is above every name and that all things will bow at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus asked them, What is your name? Notice they knew his name. Jesus said, what's your name? And they said, my name, our name is Legion. And what's interesting is a legion is a Roman army regiment of about 6,000 men, 1,200 horsemen, and a number of technical specialists who go along with the regiment. In fact, most scholars will say, how many soldiers from Roman culture actually were in this actual 10 cities? Studies have shown about 1,200 or about 6,000 soldiers and 1,200 horsemen and about an entire regiment known as a legion. So the same amount of Roman culture soldiers that were in all of these 10 cities was about the same number of demons in one man. And here in this moment, Jesus cast this, these demons out of this man. What a moment. What an incredible moment to know that Jesus not only has authority and control over the waves of the sea, but he's also got authority and control and ruling and reigning over every demon in this world. And maybe some of us for the very first time would recognize it today, and maybe for some of us in a very long time would say, yes and amen, that we're grateful that Jesus is a name above every name. That he could dominate the sea that they thought was controlled by demons, and here he dominates the demons. Unclean spirits and unclean animals are both wiped out in one fell sweep. And so the, the, the demons have to go somewhere, and where's Jesus pointing to? Jesus points the demons where? <clears throat> Look at verse 13. He gives them permission. Like, don't, don't, don't cast us out. We, we want to go somewhere else. He gives them permission and the impure spirits come out and they go into the pigs. And some of us who love bacon are like, no, not the pigs. The herd is about what? 2,000 in number. 
And the pigs suddenly what? They lose their mind. Listen, pigs are intelligent. Suddenly they're not so intelligent. What do they do? They run down the steep bank into the lake and they're drowned. And you can imagine the disciples just being there like, whoa, we thought this guy was going to kill us. And now 2,000 swine, where are they going? And now they're just jumping off this cliff into the, into the sea. That pandemonium is going on. And suddenly, where's the demon-possessed man? Verse 15, the man is just sitting there. The one who's been running. The one who's been howling. The one who's been screaming. The one who's been convulsing. The one who's been foaming. The one who's been hurting and killing and ravishing is now completely at peace because he's encountered the one his soul has longed for. Friends, don't you know that we live in a world that is ravaged by their own sin and shame? We live in a world full of people who are hurting, who are lost, who feel least and lonely and last. And they're convulsing and they're foaming and they're swinging and they're yelling and they're angry and they're hurting other people. Why? Because they desperately need the peace of God to settle their souls. To cast out the demons from in their heart and their past. To help them become transformed people. They're tired of living on the other side. And they need to be given the truth, the way, the truth, and the life that they desperately need. And this moment, this is what happens to this man. His life has changed. He's transformed by the Spirit of God. And all these legion of demons go into these pigs. And you think there'd be like a crowd, a village of people that get together and be high-fiving Jesus. The man who's ravaged our city, like he's fine. He's sitting there. We've never seen him sit for years. He's calm. He maybe get him some clothes finally, you know, and, and suddenly they're high five and they're excited. No, that's not what we see from the community at all, is it? Hey, Jesus, thank you for helping this demon possessed man. We know that you're here to help this man that we couldn't help. He's been breaking the fetters and the chains for years and suddenly you calmed him. He's completely different. Thank you, Jesus. We're glad you're here. We'll follow you, Jesus. Is that the reaction of the community? No, that's not the reaction at all. In fact, Here's the reaction. How dare you put those demons in our pigs? How dare you take our herd and throw them into the sea and maybe kill all of our swine? Notice this. When people don't understand the work of God and the kingdom of God, they'll care more about the pigs than they do the people. You see, they thought demon possession was scary, but here's what Jesus is going to teach them. Demon possession is scary. It's one thing. Money obsession is terrifying. It's another thing. You see, they should have been excited about this demonic man being saved and transformed by the supernatural work of God, by just him just mentioning by name and they would have to flee. But instead, they're what? They're obsessed about the swine. They're obsessed about the herd. They're obsessed about this, this, this money that's going over the drain. They, hey, Jesus, don't you know how much we paid for that? Hey, Jesus, don't you know how, how much we've uh, t- you know, tended to, that, to those, all those pigs? Don't you know how much time we put in? Hey, Jesus, you're just going to treat our blue and gold like that? Like, what's up with that, Jesus? And maybe, maybe they couldn't handle the demon possession because they spent all their time with money obsession. And maybe, just maybe, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but maybe North America doesn't recognize demon possession because we have money obsession. And may this be a warning to every one of us, and it starts with me, that maybe if I don't see more supernatural advancement in the kingdom of God, in my community, in this church, it could, be, it could be that we need to check our pocketbooks first. And it's terrifying to think that we wouldn't see the supernatural work of God among us because something else has become preeminent over Christ. And here this community is not responding like they should be. The demon possession has been fearful, but money obsession to them has been deceitful. We see this man as a roaring lion as he encounters Jesus before the miracle. Now we see that 
that now the demonic work is an angel of light after the miracle in the townspeople. The demonic man is spiritually possessed. The unbelieving community is materially obsessed. But here's the good news. The gospel is for demon-possessed people and materially obsessed people. And we should say all yes and amen to that. The gospel is good news for possessed and obsessed people. And so maybe you're here and you go, man, possessed, obsessed, I might fit one of those quarter categories. The gospel's for you. Maybe you're thinking about some friends, some coworkers. The gospel's for them. Are we praying for those who are possessed? Or are, we, are we honest about things that maybe we're too obsessed with? And here, verse 18 and 20, Jesus gets into the boat to leave, and the man who's been demon-possessed begs to go with him. He's been sitting there, and he's like, well, Jesus, hey, where are you going? You're, were you loading up in the boat? Like, you just got here. Like, I mean, you, that was pretty crazy. I've been changed. Can I go with you? And Jesus says, no, no, no. I've got another mission for you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go back home to your people. I want you to tell them what? How much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And what did the man do? He quickly obeyed. He goes away and he begins to tell Decapolis, all the region, 10 cities, like, like all of green country. He starts telling them how much Jesus had done for him. Results, and all the people were amazed. Isn't that great? Like, hey, you, no, 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 you're not the demon-possessed man. I've seen the demon-possessed man. You're not him. No, it's me. No, guys, it's me. I'm the one, you know, the one that was wreaking havoc on this community. That was me now. With just one word from Jesus, my life has been changed. Look what he's done for me. Look how he's had mercy on me. Look how he's changed me and what he's done for me. And listen, he can do it for you too. You can imagine this man going from city to city, from place to place, telling the story, telling the story, and people are like, whoa, did you hear? The crazy man's been changed. The possessed man, the one that's ravaged our community, he's changed. And listen, friends, we have the same opportunity. If Jesus can use a demon-possessed man, good news, he can use you and me too. And if you're taking notes, Here's the thing we have to do. Tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how He's had mercy on you. That, does, that seems too simple, doesn't it? Who could you tell? Who have you told? Who could you share with today, this week, today, this week? Who could you text? Who could you share a message? What could you post? Who could you reach out to? Listen, don't let the enemy convince you that you have to be a theologian to do the very thing that you were created to do, which is what? Tell people on purpose, for a purpose, the, what the Lord has done for you and how much mercy He's had on your life. And maybe we don't see enough supernatural activity because we don't have enough people maybe going out to tell people what God's done for them. Maybe the people aren't amazed because we haven't told them anything amazing. And what's crazy is what's amazing, what's mind-blowing. Can I give you a sneak peek of what happens here? This is not the end of the story. Do you know the story keeps going? Just turn over real quick to Mark chapter 7 and we'll be done. Mark chapter 7, verse 31 through 37. Jesus comes all the way back around. He does ministry. Whoever preaches Mark chapter 7 is going to be mad at me because I gave you a sneak peek of this. All the way back around, Jesus suddenly, days later, weeks later, he suddenly encounters a crowd who's heard. Everybody in the crowd has heard about what? About his power. They ran through the whole region and they're carrying sick on the mats to wherever they heard he was. And they're going to villages and towns and countryside and they're placing down the sick and they're begging him to let them touch even the hem of, his, of the garment or the edge of his cloak. And everyone who touched him by faith were, were healed. There's actually a meaning there that actually everyone already had faith when Jesus arrived. And people were more receptive to Jesus there than they've ever been in any other place they had ever gone. How did that happen? Like the, the revival's breaking out, Mark 7. What was the work done way before? Mark chapter 5. Catch this. The demon-possessed man was the original Billy Graham. And he went telling and telling and witnessing and witnessing. 
and witnessing and Christ comes back around and there's droves of people who already believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that he can heal, just wanting just to touch him to receive his power. The good news is, is that the gospel can take demon-possessed people and materially obsessed people and can transform their life to be gospel-sharing people. And the ministry of one person can be the light to the rest of the unbelieving world. Friends, may it be so with us as well. Who could you tell? Who will you tell? How would God already be going before you? Who are the people of peace that God is sending your way? you got to be willing to what? We have to be willing to first go to the other side. And maybe this week it's across the hallway. Maybe for you it's across the cul-de-sac. Maybe for you it's across the complex. Maybe for you it's down the street. Maybe it's, it's across the table. Maybe it's next to where you get coffee. Maybe it's across the world. But listen, may God raise up a church that actually believes that the risen Christ can take demonic possessed people and materially obsess people and turn them upside down for their good and God's glory. And may we be people who really live as if we believe it. Amen? And may the world be amazed. Let's stand for prayer. Father, may you do this work in us. The Lord, where we've denied supernatural activity, where we've explained it away, where we've ignored it, where we've been deceived that it isn't happening, where we thought this world was a playground and not a spiritual battleground, Lord, would you open up our eyes? Would you quicken our hearts? Would you make our, our minds aware that we are not battling against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces and works of the enemy in high places? The Lord, where we not even just seize demonic possession, but where we face spiritual oppression. It is true. If we're about the kingdom of God, if we're doing the work of the ministry, no matter what our vocation is, God, it's true. We'll face opposition. And there will be all kinds of opposition against any advancement of the kingdom of God. It could be what we sense and feel as we practice pure religion. It, it could be uh, what we sense as we try to share the gospel. Help us not to be afraid, Lord. Help us to walk in courage. It could be what we sense in our own minds as the enemy tries to tempt us to be deceived by the lies of this world and by the condemnation of Satan. Lord, help us to not believe the lies, but to hold to the truth of the Word of God. Help us to be led by your Spirit. Help us to walk in obedience, Lord. Help us to really believe that you'll use people just like us to share the amazing truth of Jesus Christ to our neighbor and the nations. May we live with this purpose in mind. May you give us names right now, Lord, in our minds. And may you give images, faces, people. May we pray. May we fast. May we ask you, plead with you, Lord, to do a work. May we sense where you're moving and drawing people. And where we maybe get frustrated or discouraged about maybe one area not moving quick enough or people not being open to the gospel enough. May we also still not, not uh, you know, grow weary in well-doing, but we look to either other places that you're working. And may your gospel seeds continue to be thrown and grown all across this world. We pray this in Christ's name. And all the church said, amen. Let's be saved.